Matthew chapter 7, if you would there. Matthew chapter 7. We're going to read, uh, begin verse, in verse 13. Matthew chapter 7. Bring you this title again on the rock or sand, where your life is built. Rock or sand. I was thinking this week about some family, different examples, even in our own life, where we've seen where that sand and all of a sudden everything collapse in their life. The truth is, the trials some of us have already been through. We've hit some of these tests in life, and this is why we need to... Some of you, that's why you turned to the Lord in salvation to start with. You hit bottom, something happened, and it caused you to be open to the message of the gospel where you weren't before, right? And so, now as we are studying this, we're saying, Lord, where am I in this? Am I building my life? On the rock of the sand, Lord Jesus gives this whole passage, I mean, it's more than half the chapter, to this warning. Beginning verse 13 of Matthew 7, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, But inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? What's the answer? No. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree, it gets personal, it's individual. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down. And cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Verse 22 is a sobering word. Many, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied thy name? In thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. We know from Luke that he digged deep, that's the word used, digged, digged deep, and found it on the rock, put the foundation. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came, And the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So we conclude this this message on the same title, Rock or Sand? Rock or Sand? Uh, We've brought four T's, or this will be the fourth. In this last message, we're looking at the teacher Jesus, this is the last of the four T's. Now help us look at our life and know whether we're built on the rock or sand. First of all, we looked at our trust, your trust. What are you trusting in? And we looked at it from verses 21 to 23, and the, the warning is don't trust the wrong thing. Are people sincerely going to come to the Lord in that day and say, Lord, Lord. And he's going to say, I'm sorry, I never knew you. People have faith in faith. Our faith is to be in the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people have faith in the church. Don't trust their own thing. What a warning he gives. What about your trust? The Puritans devoted not just chapters but volumes to the question, the danger of false peace. And this danger has been recognized through the centuries, and Jesus is referring to it there. There are going to be those in that day saying, Lord, Lord, and I'm going to say, I never knew you. But we did all this in your name. I never knew you. Depart from me. Then we saw the two, this double picture that he gave in verses 24 to 27. 
You know, all three of the pictures, of course, were designed to warn us. The first one to warn us about the false prophet there, the danger of being deceived by appearances. Also, by the way, the false prophet's in the church, right? The danger of that it's in the church. He's just a wolf, but he's in sheep's clothing, right? You have to dig below the surface to recognize. You need the Holy Spirit's discernment because we're so easily deceived, aren't we? We're easily deceived by appearance. And so we need to not be superficial in judgment. And they look at their fruits, look at the fruit of their life. Number two, the second picture he gave was the, the one here about this false peace, that people that who assume that everybody that says, Lord, Lord, is one of his, shall enter in. He says, not everyone, verse 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord. In fact, in verse 22, he says, many, many in that day. And so the picture is designed to warn us of deceive, the danger of deceiving ourselves. Self-delusion, self-deception. The third picture, this is the two here. It's a double picture of the two houses and the two men. We looked at both sides of that, the two houses and the two men. It warns us of the danger of seeking and desiring only the benefits and the blessings of salvation and resting on our apparent possession of them until that stream hit vehemently on the house and it fell. Houses looked good until then. And the third, we looked at last week, the tests. These tests, this third T, these are for ourselves to look at. And we looked at our own life. Nothing is more important than knowing that you are Christ and that Christ is yours, that heaven's your home. Yet Jesus had given all these verses and examples to stress this point. He gives all this from verse 13 on to stress this point that many in that day will not know me. Many are going in the, straight, uh, the broad way that lead destruction. And we listed several of the tests. First test was false Christian to please, is out to please himself. And then the false Christian picks out of the Bible what he likes, what appeals to him. He likes the doctrine of love of God, but not the doctrine of the justice of God. And to avoid this, we must constantly examine ourselves in the light of this book and let the mirror of God's word. Lord, where am I here? Show me, teach me. Like James talked about that mirror of God's word until the Bible says, until Christ be formed in you. In other words, the trouble with the false Christian is that he doesn't really desire to know God. He wants God's blessing, but he doesn't want God, not the God of the Bible. And we find that in our day, there's many Christians that want what they have made, the Jesus of their own making, the God of their own making, but they don't want the God of the Bible. Not the one that says, come out from among them, be a separate, saith the Lord, touch not the unclean thing. Not the one that says, be holy, for I am holy. No, they don't want that one. They want the one that just forgives and is, is kind, but he is. If you love people and love righteousness, you must hate the evildoer and hate sin. And that's who God is, see. You can't love if you're not just, right? No one would say if it was your brother that was murdered. Someone was telling us about a double murder this week at, near their workplace there, yeah, near Alabama Adventure, that exit in Birmingham. Broad daylight, 4 o'clock. And uh, no one, if it was your brother that got killed, no one would say, that's a good judge if the judge let him off and said, oh, it's okay, you can go free. No, no, no. That's an awful, wicked judge. I want justice, Right? And so the love of God and the justice of God go together beautifully because God took his wrath out on his own son as he hung there on the tree and the billows of God's wrath rolled on him for your sin and for my sin. Because he's a holy God, because he's a just God, there must be payment for sin. But the Bible says if we won't receive that, John 3, 36, the wrath of God abides on the person that will not receive the Lord Jesus and what he did for your sin, for mine. The wrath's already been poured out. Jesus took our payment, our punishment, but we must come to him. And then we talked about the test of death. What is death to us? Are we horrified at the thought of it? Are we so afraid of it that we always do our best not to think about it and try to banish that thought? The Christian death is wonderful, the Bible says. It's to be with the Lord. And not in some morbid way, but God says... Precious in the eyes of the Lord are the death of his saints. Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present of the Lord. He said to die is far better. I'll be with Christ. He said, I'll continue. 
for you, the Lord allows. Fourth T we come to this morning. It could be one of two. I'll show you both of them in this T, but the temptation or the teacher. But really the teacher is going to be our focus. This is verse 28 and 29. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Let's pray. Father, help us now, please. Father, I know we've been in this message a couple weeks. Would you bring the freshness of this last two verses to our hearts? Oh, may we get a glimpse of who you are and what you are. Lord, this isn't a message that's wonderful because the message is wonderful. It's a message that's wonderful because the messenger, the teacher, is God himself. And so I pray we would see what you're saying to us from your word here in Matthew 7. Have your way, may your Holy Spirit rule and reign in every heart in here, and that we would yield to you in Jesus' name. Amen. It's quite something to see the effect of this message. If you read it all in one sitting, you'd come through Matthew 5, 6, and 7, is all one message by our Lord Jesus Christ, the greatest message ever preached. All Bible scholars agree, this is the great message the greatest message we have recorded in the Bible. And, of course, no doubt it's Jesus preaching, right? Matthew 5, 6, and 7. But he comes to the end, and I want you to notice quite something to see the effect that the Sermon on the Mount, it had on those people that day. Look what it produced. It says in verse 28, It came to pass when Jesus, don't miss that, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. And doctrine just means teaching what he had taught, the truths that he taught. They were astonished. Why were they astonished? For he taught them as one having authority and not, not as the scribes. See, it gives us a clue there in those last two verses to the effect that this Sermon on the Mount ought to have on all of us every time it's looked at and studied. It always should produce the effect on someone that reads it and considers that, wow. I know what it has on me is that, boy, I need the Lord Jesus. I cannot live the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, look at the last verse of Matthew 5. Be ye perfect as your Father is perfect, your Heavenly Father. I can't live this life. Poor in spirit, that's not my nature. My nature is to be full of pride. How about you? I need the Lord Jesus. I need His help. They're astonished at His doctrine, the power He preached, and Christ exhorted them to put into practice this terrible, this strong warning of self-deception here at the end of the chapter 7, the end of the message. And of course, the temptation here I mentioned could have been the T. I'm going to use the teacher. But the temptation that many may have is to ask as they finish the Sermon on the Mount, well, what about it? <laughs> Why should we practice the Sermon on the Mount? Why should we give heed to the strong warning here? And the real answer, of course, is in verse 28. And it came to pass when, what's the next word? Jesus. Jesus. See, the real answer to that question is the person himself who's doing the teaching. See, we can't concentrate only on the sermon, only. It's great, I mean, it's a great message. I mean, we've studied on it now for some time. It's a great passage of Scripture, but you can't just look at the sermon only. You've got to go further than that. So what do you mean? You've got to get to the messenger. You've got to go beyond. Hey, this is wonderful. This is vital. This is so good. But as wonderful and vital, as powerful the message as it is, you've got to get to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, the preacher himself. Look, with us, for all teachers this world has ever known, the main thing about the teacher is his teaching. I mean, Jesus has already just said it. Beware of false prophets. Hey, Paul say, if someone come and preach some other gospel other than the gospel you've been preaching, let him be accursed, even if it's me. That's what Paul said. Whether it's me or someone else to preach something other, let him be a curse. So the judge, the guide is always the teaching. 
But like no other teacher, what gives weight to the Lord's teaching is not first and primarily His teaching. It's who the teacher is. It's God. This is the Lord doing the teaching. So the moment He opens His mouth, we don't have to say, is that true? Is this right? Is this, is this something that we should believe? But as second he begins to speak, we know it's true. We know it's right. We know this is what is the absolute truth. He is the Word of God. That's one of his names. He's the living Word. He can't speak but what is true. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. And so this is powerful as you think about the teachings of other men or other preachers, even ones that we would hold in high esteem of years gone by or the Apostle Paul or others. Because this teacher, the important thing is not just the teaching. In the case of this teacher, it's not just what he taught, but rather who he is. See, the Sermon on the Mount just keeps pointing us to Jesus Christ. Just keeps pointing us to Jesus Christ and our need of Him. Essentially, the vital point of all teaching of theology of the whole Bible is to point us to Jesus. That's the point. And here, in verse 29, I love it, God's point of His Word is to bring us to the knowledge of Him, to bring us to the day of salvation. That's the goal. In fact, 1 John chapter of uh, uh, five tells us the goal of first john in particular but really it's the goal of the word of god in general these things are written unto you that believe on the name of the son of god that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the son of god why did god give us the bible not just so we could know how the world was created although i'm glad we know and not just so we could know about the flood or about uh, the children of Israel or what happened in this, these different things. Not just so we could know about Christmas and what God did in coming to this earth. But so we could know Him. So we could come to know Him. You may hear something this morning that intrigues your thought or makes you think and say, Wow, I'm kind of more knowledgeable now as a result of being in church. But I want you to know God's goal for you this morning is not just to be more knowledgeable or have something tickle your fancy mentally, but God's goal for you is to know the Lord Jesus Christ and come into a relationship with Him. If you don't know Him as your Savior, some of you have been saved recently. It doesn't matter how long you've been in church, it doesn't matter what your past is, until you come to know Him as Savior, life really doesn't begin. But once you know Him as Savior, now Jesus says there's a new life. That's why I came, to give, that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. Not the old life with new pain on it. Not the same leaf just turned over, but a brand new life in Christ. Pretty amazing. Verse 29, he says here, I want you to notice the negative first. For he taught them as one having authority and what? Not as the scribes. Not as the scribes. See, the scribes never uttered one thing original. If you would have heard the scribes in their day, you would hear, quote, 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 quoting other people. In fact, they would be quoting much from the Talmud, which in itself was, is wicked if you've ever uh, read it. But uh, it was just the, what their past uh, priests and past uh, uh, rabbis had written their, their teachings about things. In fact, Jesus would condemn, you have taken the law of God and by your tradition, you've ruined what God gave because they'd added so many things. He said, you've added so many things that no one could bear and you yourself don't even try. But you place this burden on others to try to bear. It's pretty powerful what the Bible says. But Christ, when he began to teach, see, he says, you've heard that it's been said you should not kill. But I say unto you. And they were shocked and astonished at his confidence, at his strength in his speech and how he was willing to correct and, and he was certain of what he spoke and he was willing to correct past rabbis that they held in high esteem and he was willing to correct their authorities, if you will. And even what the Talmud said, but I say unto you. He didn't hesitate to correct the teaching of the Pharisees or the Sanhedrin or any of those that they held in high esteem because he said, I'm speaking to you the word of God and these words are life 
This is the truth, as my Lord, as my Father intended. He claims the authority for himself and for his teaching. Look, for instance, look at the beginning of verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of, what? Mine, and doeth them. This is powerful. Now, if I was to get up this morning without the Bible open, and to say to all of you, now listen here. If you all listen to what I say today, and you'll do them, I'll tell you this is what you'll have with your life. Be pretty bold. Some would say, be pretty arrogant. But this is what Jesus said. And of course, he had the authority to do it. Remember what he said? All power on heaven and earth is given unto me. <laughs> it's all given to me. And then he gives it to you as the Father sent me. So send I you. That's what Jesus said. See, so he had all authority to say this. And so, as you would imagine, it was shocking. This message was astonishing, as the Bible says in verse 28. He was saying some powerful things. Notice the significance in verse 24 that he attached to his own teaching. He's really saying something quite powerful about himself. Whoever doeth the sayings of mine. Whoever heareth and doeth the sayings of mine. You realize who I am. If you'll realize who I am, then you'll realize the importance of what I say. See? He was pointing this out all through the message. He's making quite the pronouncement about himself. Notice Matthew 5, verse 11. I pointed this out a week or two ago. But he says in verse 11 of Matthew 5, same sermon here. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for whose sake? For my sake. Again, he's saying they're going to persecute you for obeying me. Who's this person who talks like this? We're going to suffer persecution for his sake? Who is this who says he can make us the salt of the world? Who is this that says he can make us, or salt of the earth? Who is this that says he can make us the light of the world? Well, the only one that could do that is the capital L light of the world, right? And his light comes to live within us in the person of Jesus Christ by his spirit. Look at Matthew 5, verse 17. If you're still there in Matthew 5, notice he says there, verse 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, this is powerful. On several levels, first of all, he doesn't say that I was born. He says, I am come. See, we're about to have Christmas, and some people have the idea that Jesus began in Bethlehem. But the truth is, Mary brought forth what God sent forth. You read the whole message of the Bible. He was from everlasting to everlasting. He's the great... One, I'll read a verse about that in just a minute. But the Bible says that he was come. John 1 will say, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And then in verse 14 it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as of the glory only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so we understand that he, was not, he did not begin in Bethlehem. He says, I am come. I'm come. He's come from eternity to heaven. And then he says there he has fulfilled the law and the prophets. I'm not come to destroy the law or the prophets. He said, I'm come to fulfill it. What do you mean? Well, it means two things. So not only is he sinless, he fulfilled the law, but also he was the one that the prophets all spoke of. He was the one that all the prophecies pointed to. He is the Messiah, see he's saying. I've come to fulfill all the prophets. You know Isaiah, whom you read about? He's talking about me. You know Jeremiah, you all read after? That's me, I'm come to fulfill all of that. You know Daniel's prophecy and Isaiah, and on and on he would go through. Ezekiel and on. Look at chapter 7, verse 21 of Matthew. Not everyone that saith unto, what? Me. Me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in the kingdom of heaven. Me. He doesn't hesitate to tell people, 
they're going to address me as Lord. See, Philippians would tell us that he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, uh, things, things in earth, things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So he not, does not hesitate to declare that they're going to say to me, Lord, Lord. He is Jehovah, see. He is God. The Jehovah of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the New Testament. They're one and the same. I tell people I'm a Jehovah Witness too when I meet Jehovah Witnesses. Not the way they mean it. But we are called, he says, ye are my witnesses, right? <laughs> it's him that we're a witness of. He's the one and the same. In fact, this is the verse I like to take to him too. In fact, last time I had Jehovah's Witness at my house, I took him to Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born. No doubt this is Jesus. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. Oh, I know Mighty God, they said, but not the Almighty God. That's what the, the Jehovah's Witness said to me. I said, well, what about the next part? The Everlasting Father. <laughs> That's what it says. The Prince of Peace. Then, chapter 7, verse 23, And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquities. You know what he's saying? Judgment is committed unto me. I am going to declare that I never knew you. Depart from me. So he's saying some powerful things about himself. No wonder they were astonished. Who is this man that speaks with such authority as they hear this carpenter? <laughs> this lowly carpenter? From, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? <clears throat> Apparently ordinary until they heard him speak. <laughs> Even when they were trying to catch him in his words, remember, near the end of his ministry when they wanted to kill him and they sent people for that purpose, they came back and they said, what do you have for us? And they said, never a man spake like this man. What were they saying? There's something about this man. It's not just a man. He is God. Even the ones that killed him, the Roman centurion, as he saw, as he hung his head and bowed his head in death and the earthquake and the darkness and all that took place, even the soldiers said, surely this was the Son of God. That's what they're understanding. This isn't just an ordinary carpenter. He's the judge, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, that's how the scribes reacted. But I want to ask you this morning, what's your reaction? You've heard the preaching of the Sermon on the Mount. These people were astonished, but we must go beyond astonishment. We must come to the place where we say, surely this is the Son of God. This isn't just astonishing doctrine by a great teacher. No, this is Emmanuel, God with us. He is the Son of God, and salvation is only through His name. That's the central truth of the gospel. The Almighty is here in flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So what's the message of the Sermon on the Mount? Well, the Lord condemns forever the thought that any human effort, human endeavor, natural ability will do anything in the matter of salvation. Well, we've seen that. That's an impossibility just from the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. Because we've all come short of the glory of God. Haven't we? For all have sinned, right, and come short of the glory of God. We're condemned sinners in the sight of God. We need a new birth. We need a new life, and that is what the Lord Jesus is saying. That's what He's preaching. Come to me. You can have a heavenly Father now. I couldn't make it in this world, and Matthew 6 it emphasized over and over, but your heavenly Father, your heavenly Father, your heavenly Father means there must be a new birth for you to have a new Father. <laughs> Before we were of our Father the devil, John eight forty four, but now... Your heavenly Father, the one in heaven, 
And he's described his disciple as Christian people here who have received the Holy Spirit. That's what he's described in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So I want to ask you this morning, do you know the Lord Jesus, your Savior? If you were to die where you sit this morning, if you were to die on the way home, if it was what happened to the Alabama, the Alabama Adventure exit right there, they pulled up beside him and shot him, killed both the passengers in the car. If that was you today, would you be in heaven with the Lord or in hell? Would you lift up your eyes be in torment? And this is what Jesus is trying to get across at the end of, the, of his message. Hey, there's a broad way. It leads to destruction, and many are headed that way. But there is a straight way, and few there be that find it. Hey, there are trees that are corrupt tree, and you can know them by the fruits, but there also are good trees. Hey, not only that, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord. And just because you come to church, as I said last week, just because you might say amen or even read your Bible and pray, do you know the Lord? Does he meet with you when everything else is stripped away? Do you have an audience with God? Do you know God is there when you speak to him in prayer and worship him on your own? Do you have a walk and relationship with him? I would dare say many, 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 many Christians don't know that. Do not have that. They don't even attempt it. The Bible is put on a shelf. It's left in the back seat of their car. They don't read it. They don't study it. They don't seek God in prayer. They, if you ask them to tell me an answer to prayer, they wouldn't have them because they haven't been praying. I'm not mad at you at all. I'm just saying, along with me, we have to get back to what God says in His Word. And He says, I never knew you to these people. Do you know Him? Not just you prayed a prayer somewhere, but would you walk with him as he one you know? He's described in the, this sermon, not the natural man striving to make himself right with God, but God making his people new at the new birth. This isn't sin, this perfection, of course. The true believer wants to live the Sermon on the Mount and does his utmost to do so, but then he comes to that part and says, Lord, I have to ask. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek. Lord, I need to seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened. And the Bible says, ye, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your, heavenly to your children. How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? And so we recognize we need the Spirit of God to help us. I need the Lord. And you realize, we realize our failure and we pray, be filled with the Spirit. The Christian understands that I need the Lord and they hunger and thirst after righteousness. Luke eleven thirteen. 13, If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more should your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? See, this is the true reaction to the Sermon on the Mount. Recognize that He is the Son of God. He came to start a new, if you will, these that are born from above. And all but who belong to him are going to be like him. Glory to glory, to be like him. One day we will be like him. We will see him as he is. We'll be like him that day. Astounding doctrine, yeah. Astonishing, amazing doctrine, absolutely. Thank God we know it is the truth. The truth. And we're conscious of the fact that he's dealing with us and that his spirit is working in us and revealing to us our shortcomings and our imperfections. And Creating a longing, a desire, an aspiration within us to be like Him, working in us both to will and to do of His good pleasure. 2 Timothy 1.12, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. Do you know Him? And am persuaded that He is able to keep that which I committed unto Him against that day. 1 Corinthians 3.11, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. I love 2 Timothy 2.19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them are His. Again, throughout the New Testament, it's pointed out, do you know you're His? There is those that are not His and those that are His. And you become His by putting your faith and trust in Him, repenting of your sin and turning to Him. But God says He knows them they're His. I don't just believe He just knows who they are. I mean, 
we walk with Him and talk with Him and they know Him. That's what Paul was saying. I know whom I have believed. I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that He is able to keep that which I've committed unto Him against that day. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are His, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So I ask you for the last time, rock or sand, what is your life built on? Are you the one on rock or the one on the sand? I've given these two illustrations in, from the Scriptures about Judas. Looked like one of the twelve, preached like one of the twelve, cast out demons and did mighty works like one of the twelve. But in the end, the Bible said he went to his own place. He's burning in hell at this moment. That's what the Bible says. Demas was the other. Demas, fellow laborer, Paul called him. He's a fellow laborer in this gospel ministry, but by the end, Demas had forsaken me. Having loved this present world, and 1 John 2.15 says, love not the world, neither things that are in the world. For he that loved the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Yet Paul said he looks so good. Not only that, he's involved. He's a fellow laborer. But the storm hit. His house built on sand fell. And great was the fall of it. Will you bow in prayer with me?